um, environmental design as a form of activism rather than uh, a sort of an, an abstract you know, photo in a picture book on a coffee table, how can we begin to marshal our skill set towards different ends? And so a key theme of the book is really to practice landscape architecture differently rather than just respond to a, a preconceived brief. We are looking for ways to overlay um, regenerative infrastructure and landscape systems with scales of community involvement. And for me, that's really the, the defining kind of force of urban ecology is to sort of bring together social uh, uh, systems and, and social life and uh, also a kind of a re-articulation and a regeneration of physical urban landscapes. And that's really our goal is integrating design and research towards finding these new synergies between people and ecosystems. Um, and so our goals also are to really, and, and this is the role I think of the landscape architect moving forward. We need to generate ecosystems. We need to forge new connections between people and the animal life. And this is a escape, we, we, we did a, um, an installation at Raritan Bay Festival here, but understand the interconnectedness of, of people and habitat. We need to embrace the physical reality of our landscapes, in many cases contaminated um, or with poor water quality. Uh, we can't just kind of gloss that over in a glossy green magazine. We need to understand literally how those uh, the physical reality of the, the landscape is impacting public health and well-being. We need to revive hidden landscape systems. This is a view from one of our projects in Lexington, Kentucky, where you can see on the right-hand side here, I think I have a, oh, there you go. Um, and urban boils, right? And I know this is probably endemic to some neighborhoods here in Atlanta, where literally you have a flood and then water comes up from below. But on the right-hand side, you can see sort of natural boils in a limestone karst pool. So we need to revive these systems and bring them back into our urban environment. Uh, moreover, we need to begin to experiment and think about almost every landscape project that we do as a pilot for adaptation and change and integration into a new policy context. This is an experiment uh, for water quality in the Gowanus Bay. We need to engage people um, and in new and creative ways, not your just traditional, here's a public meeting, you sit on the one side because you're for the project and you sit on the other side because you're against the project. We try to imagine and think about design uh, relative to engagement strategies. This is a sort of a fuzzy rope knitting party that we hosted at our office that helped engender this uh, muscle pilot structure. Um, and so how can sort of people not just be passive uh, and reactive to something, how can we engage them in this broader discussion and in this urban landscape change process? So a little bit more about climate here, because this is um, um, a, a, a graph that I find both troubling and maybe hopeful. Um, this is, if you can see here in the, the note, it's our IPCC represented greenhouse gas concentration pathways, right? So if we did literally nothing, we would be on this red curve, and we're pretty much on the red curve. And um, even if we made radical changes to our economy, kind of decarbonized our economy, we would be probably along this line. So the reality is we're going to be somewhere in that, in that box. But we are, you know, have to act now. So um, changes on resilience, like Otis mentioned this morning, we need to begin now. Um, because regardless of our choices, we are going to have a dramatically altered physical landscape. And that doesn't just mean that we'll have more water. It literally means that human lives will be affected. You know, we are seeing now climate change migration, uh, not only in the United States, but, but globally. And often the poorest of the poor are the most impacted. So back to, to scape a little bit, because um, we have a lot of, this is our image of a present project in Lexington, um, a streetscapes image in Buffalo, but I kind of wanted to highlight this in-between space, because another way that we've tried to act in the New York environment is not, is to sort of conceive projects and um, to advance them in a, in a sort of new way uh, through this research framework process. Um, and this is an example of literally kind of peer infrastructure falling into the water that we began to um, re-describe uh, uh, as um, um, intertidal habitat, and we basically saved this pier from being demolished. But in many cases, the, the, the role of the landscape architect has to change 
Also in the sense that in the past we might have thinking like, oh, we're gonna like place this you know, new landscape in this space. The reality is a lot of what landscape architects need to do in this century is take away right, the, the sort of modern um, uh, 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 forms that have begun separating people um, and, and landscapes and fragmenting habitats. This is an example of a scape project um, in, in Manhattan where um, a typical uh, wall was kind of taken down and the sort of public space and public realm of, of the street was sort of integrated into institution, making this much more generous and open public space um, that also helped to provoke institutional change and provide shady gathering spaces. So like, we have to take the walls down in so many different ways. We also have to delete streets and parking lots. And I know that there's a big project here in Atlanta uh, around the, the stadium. This is an image of Lexington, Kentucky in Rupp Arena in which one of the key largest sites around a 15 acre site is occupied by parking, and this is a, um, a, a, a hollow, right, sort of a, a, a watery um, uh, uh, ground. And so our project um, with Mayor and others is to kind of daylight this stream in strategic places, to not you know, move from the idea of a, a back of a building to create a new front, an inspiring front to Rep Arena that kind of meets a new public realm, and to integrate habitat um, on this daylight stream and places for people to um, to gather and to play. And um, what's important is this is a multifunctional park. Parks aren't just for passive recreation or active in recreation. This is a park that is also helping to hold uh, major uh, flooding events. In the same way, this is another view of our Lexington project. We're trying to highlight the former creek bed of uh, a town branch. And whether we can actually do that, there's a, uh, you can see the, the stormwater bioswale here on the edge, or, or whether we can just capture that water before it goes into a culvert below. We really want to reveal the former, you know, extents of these ecosystems and kind of bring them back into people's everyday lives. Because you can't, you know, you can't, this is a way of kind of having some people care about and, and, and make it a more direct and immediate connection with the immediate environs. And I think this is a real, goal of the landscape architect. Another aspect that scape has really advanced is this is a park, but this is also a park, right? So we need to move out of these kind of very um, um, conventional ways of thinking about green space as being our public parks, because water um, shorelines and rocky shorelines that have diversity and change and wide tidal ranges this is, these are the parks of the next century. These are the landscapes that will be disappearing with our, what is called the coastal squeeze, right? As sea levels rise and we've increasingly hardened our shores. These are the landscapes that are incredibly biologically productive and also incredi incredibly endangered. So let's expand our definition of landscape uh, to include these intertidal uh, landscapes. And let's try to keep design from, um, I don't want to say ruining, but, but like neutralizing or neutering um, the exciting and rich spaces that uh, we live in. So the left is, um, Scape is doing a big um, master plan for the Gowanus Canal. And our entire kind of goal is to not pave over or eliminate all of the kind of smaller scale spatial room-like moments that really bring people to the actual water body. Let's kind of try to understand where those exist, map them, and foster them into our next century plan. So it's this transition from uh, land to water and this edge of land to water that Scape's probably best known for. Here we can see on your left-hand side, and I don't know Atlanta is, you know, not, does not have a waterfront, but these lessons apply in almost every city. Here on the left is our legal way of, of defining the urban waterfront, which is, everyone knows what this is, a steel vertical bulkhead with zero social uh, space value, zero habitat value. And so all around New York, we've begun to work with either private developers or a city, city land to try to thicken and enrich and enable space for intertidal flow. So those are like typologies of what we find in our modern environment that I think we need to literally attack as, as landscape architects and designers. We don't have time. Um, and. And this kind, these kinds of infrastructures do not enable change, and sea level rise is, is happening so fast 
that these species will be uh, inundated if we don't begin to design and plan differently. So I thought I would say a couple words on one of our projects, which is called Living Breakwaters, because it really hits to this theme of urban ecology, which is integrating social systems and natural systems and kind of understanding how these um, uh, processes can begin to enrich and enliven each other. Um, so this is um, a project that uh, we came to after uh, Superstorm Sandy hit the New York region. And you know, it was a critical moment after, after that um, extreme event uh, where at many, many moments there was a sort of saying, well, let's just put up a barrier uh, across the mouth of the Hudson and, and we'll just keep that water out. But of course, not thinking about obviously the way that the estuary actually moves, the species that migrate. Um, and so we were really um, key in sort of advocating for a different approach, an approach that kind of lives with water um, that reduces risk um, by taking the extreme wave action out of, out of the sort of the, uh, um, these um, hurricane events, which is what a breakwater does, um, um, and then so to protect the shore through this sort of layered system. So what is a living breakwater? In short, it's a roughly two mile long string of rocky breakwaters that are seeded with oysters. Those breakwaters provide thin fish habitat and structural um, underwater habitat, which are places for fish to spawn and um, be protected in. It reduces risk and, and helps rebuild um, through resedimentation the shoreline, and also our goal is to foster um, um, uh, culture on shore and rebuild the sort of shoreline culture through funding schools and schools-based learning through the Billion Oyster Project. So our goal isn't just to build a singular wall, it's to kind of create these for lack of a better word, codependencies really between people in the environment and help to sort of spur those on. And this for me is a kind of core lesson of resilience. Here are some images of Superstorm Sandy as it hit the uh, New York, New Jersey region. Our tunnels were inundated, there were large power outages, and we had waves crashing um, uh, um, all around uh, the, the region. And so by this you know, very strong approach, which is that Resilience uh, isn't just this kind of one-stop shopping. It's not like sustainability in a new guise. It's really about um, integrating a culture of resilience through um, direct and physical connection with a new um, and protective landscape. These um, breakwaters, you can see a sort of section here, are designed um, um, not only um, to um, reduce risk, but also to create habitat. And uh, we learned from the US Fish and Wildlife Service that this kind of structural rocky habitat was most endangered in the New York region. Um, and so we're not only designing for school kids, we're designing for this whole range of sea creatures um, that are of course out of sight and out of mind, but um, uh, make our critical part of the, the New York Harbor um, regional ecosystem. So these rocky structures create crevices for fish, fin fish, lobsters, etc. I mentioned the world word pilot and now I'm skipping through this quickly, but we are now in our kind of final pre-construction phase for this project. Um, it's exciting because it's not just a, um, a, a project that's integrating uh, with school programs on shore, it's also an experiment, in situ experiment, where we're able to uh, monitor the success of these ecosystems, and so those lessons can be applied and replicated elsewhere. So the entire uh, stretch is literally designed as a, a massive pilot. So these um, rocky breakwaters are seeded with oysters. We're working with a billion oyster project. And it's what's so exciting to me is that this is also a project that isn't so site delineated. It's really a project that's about scaling over time. So just how an oyster reef can kind of grow and expand and scale and grow on top of itself to form these rich three-dimensional mosaic of structures that can clean and filter water and that can help absorb wave action we're also kind of building up and scaling um, this educational program with the Billion Oyster Project. So these are like students, after school divers who um, are going to be critical to the success moving forward. And so we have five billion oyster schools, and this is a diagram that's showing the direction and the proximity of our key schools to the shoreline. And so we're funding our project is not only funding the physical breakwater project, it's also funding uh, uh, this, the Billion Oyster After School Curriculum 
Um, and so we will be, um, you know, helping to um, grow oysters back. We are, um, and, and if you're in the, I loved Ken's idea of like, you just need a bus. So in this world, you just need a boat. So, <laughs> so our, pro our project is also funding a floatable water hub, hub also known as a boat. And, um, and uh, so to help bring students out on the water. And what's very exciting about the Billion Oyster curriculum is that through a New York State certified science uh, program and science uh, curriculum, they're kind of doing hands-on harbor restoration. So you learn water chemistry, you learn biology, mathematics, etc., all through this lens of, of harbor restoration. So it's an exciting and I think a model and a great way to start to um, really make some very specific ties between some of these large scale urban landscape projects and uh, educators and, and students. Uh, and it's really sort of integrated into their daily lives. So um, the big take home message with, with this project is not a singular response or um, only a school approach, but how can we begin to tie the physical regeneration of a landscape whether that's a forest here in Atlanta, and I love this food, food forest idea, um, with a, a unit or of, of, of sort of social life and culture on shore. So that to me is something that builds this culture of resilience over time. And um, that's where you know, I think um, all the, the future lies is, is integrating those systems. So I thought I would talk uh, briefly about um, another park that um, SCAPE is working on in Norfolk, Virginia, one of your sister cities, also one of the 100 resilient cities, um, and, and a place that, um, as you can see located here in the, in the red, um, is facing some um, slow creep, if you will, of catastrophe. You can see here, there are um, uh, now at major intersections, these large rulers to kind of let people know if it's safe or not to cross. Because sometimes water is up at the two foot or three foot line, okay? So this is the coastal landscape of the future. It is rather extreme in Norfolk, and I believe that Norfolk and uh, at their pier, they have um, tracked uh, the highest levels of sea level rise um, on the entire eastern seaboard. But the, bay, the bottom line is, and here you can see mean sea level rise, in inches, and then here's just days of what they call nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding, right? That means the water is coming. And so how do you, how can you grapple uh, with some of these incredible challenges? Of course, many of you know, Norfolk is also um, home to some the Naval uh, Center, major um, uh, Naval operations, and a lot of, of sort of um, government and military installations. So. Um, this is a trend that is quite worrisome. So just a little bit of the background on this project, and then I'm just gonna show you how a design process works to translate this kind of large-scale ecosystem and climate analysis into a park for the people that live there. Um, so we were very involved in what was the National Disaster um, uh, Resilience Competition and in and, and other spaces, and Norfolk received a large grant um, from that process. Um, they target it towards this Ohio Creek watershed here. Um, 